Savvy, 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 that's the name you should know. Savvy, 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 he's the host of the show. With the games from the past, he's ready to cast. Savvy! Yeah. Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the Savvy Show, the show where cool peeps do dumb stuff. I'm your host Savvy here to interview your favorite content creators and today we have a super duper special guest. This was um, a very wild guest because I was like wow, I'm never going to contact them but I did. You see, uh, it's gonna be uh, some improvement during the series because I think that uh, throughout this journey, I think that the channel and me and the show has evolved so much because we've had talented people, we had Julie, we had Mikel, Sonico, and with all of these episodes, I've seen how much I have been growing as a person and how this channel has grown. It's well to see how from the stupid Super Mario Brothers review that was my first video, we've now come to something this big. So, let's quit the chit-chatting, because I know that you all are waiting to meet today's guest. So please welcome, with a warm applause, KirbyFan66! Hello, KirbyFan! Hi, hello, hello! How are we doing on this fine day? I am doing quite good, thank you. So something that I like to do with every single content creator that comes in into a show is to briefly introduce your channel, your content, and just you as a person. So I, as our, as our wonderful, lovely host just had said, I am Kirby Fan. You can find me on my YouTube channel, youtubecom slash c slash KirbyFan66. Why you would type it out instead of copying and pasting, I don't know. But hey. Uh, looking out, I guess. Uh, on that channel, you can find plenty of Kirby and Fire Emblem content. You can also find me streaming at twitch.tv. Uh, I, I am Claire Fluffle on there. I am a VTuber. Uh, you can also find me on either of my Twitter accounts, both Kirby Fan and Claire Fluffle. Uh, those are the socials for now. I have a Discord, which you can see in any of my videos. Um, and I might have more socials going for it. I'm not sure as a time of we're recording, but for now, you can find me on uh, a few different places. That's right, from what uh, Kirby fan has said, uh, we are going to talk about a lot of different things today. Kirby, Fire Emblem, and also VTubing, so it's something more different than just Kirby that we have already seen in the past few episodes. So something important is, you've said that you've done a lot of things on your channel, but you're one of the oldest channels I've interviewed on the show yet, so something I'm very curious about is what got you into making uh, YouTube content in the first place. Well, this is an answer that, especially with people of a certain age, you're just gonna hear no matter what, but... I've actually had my YouTube channel since, I believe, 2006. I believe that is when I made my Whoa. YouTube channel. I... At, for, a, for a little while, I was content with just watching videos, but then, again, you're gonna hear so many times. Uh, the angry video game nerd, James Rolf. I loved his videos, quite frankly, I still do. I still think he's one of the best uh, creators out there. <laughs> um, but I just, I saw what he did and I thought, oh, I could, I could, the thought entered my head, I can do that. It wasn't necessarily that I want to, but the thought was I could. But even as, even as a youngin, uh, little old me was a bit more concerned with playing the games well, or at least what I thought was playing them well at the time. Uh, Years down the line, I can look back and say, no, no, not really. But at the time, I thought I was playing the games really well. And I wanted more of a focus on the games being played good while I was also getting my two cents. I was much more of an outwardly, maybe not hostile, but uh, vocalized, not holding anything back of what my thoughts were. If I didn't like something, I was going to tell you uh, that I thought it was really bad. Not so much, oh, well, you know, it has its fans, something along those lines. But if I had to list one inspiration, it was definitely the angry video game nerd. More popped up as time came along, but none that left quite the same impact as James Ralph. Yeah, as you said, the angry video game nerd is one of those uh, YouTubers that has been an inspiration for a lot of people. And in some way, a lot of YouTubers have been inspired by the angry video game nerd, and those said YouTubers have inspired other people. For example, my two big biggest inspirations are 
Scott Wozniak and the Angry Video Game Nerd. And Scott the Woz has like a huge inspiration from the Angry Video Game Nerd. So it's all a full circle. And um, I think that I everybody can agree that the style from the Angry Video Game Nerd is uh, like one of the best because it's more, at the time it was kind of more of that new ground style, you know, like it wasn't uh, the YouTube we know today. It was like a start from YouTube that wasn't very much YouTube yet. It was more new grounds, but shifting towards something that was like the Wild West. Because um, if any of you have ever watched uh, the Angry Video Game Nerd, you know that he has a interesting way to um, review games. He doesn't say, as Kirby fan has said, uh, okay, yeah, the, this game is its fans. He's going to scream ass and roll and like drink uh, rolling rock in every episode. But something that I wanted to also discuss isn't only what got you into YouTube, but what got you into the two biggest series on your channel, aka Kirby and Fire Emblem. How did you get into those series? Uh, let's start with Kirby first. That's probably what more people are here for. Uh, and it's less of a... It's less convoluted. I liked Kirby from day one. Um, my first memory, actually, gaming or not, my first memory at the age of two, I remember my brother, my older brother, had a Nintendo Entertainment System and had a bunch of games for it. Uh, and I think one of his, his girlfriend at the time had lent him, I don't know if, I don't, I don't know whose it was, but uh, somehow from her, he had gotten Kirby's Adventure for the NES, one of my favorites to this day. And uh, he was playing it. He very clearly wasn't having that great of a time with it. Uh, the game was on and he just kind of walked away. And I remember just kind of picking up the controller and hitting some buttons, seeing what happened, which was a pretty big deal at the time. I don't remember too much of how bad it was. I mean, I still have it, but uh, I have a form of muscular dystrophy. I have very weak muscles. So until I entered about middle school, maybe even high school, lifting my neck was physically really hard. So just the fact that that was the first time that I can really remember, you know, I willingly went out of my way to lift, you know, use actually my body for uh, physical, as simple to most people as I'm sure picking up a controller and looking at the TV will sound. Uh, it's kind of a big deal uh, for a two-year-old with that kind of disability. Um, I didn't play very much of it. I wasn't very good. I remember doing stuff in the first world, but not really, you know, getting very far. I probably didn't even play it for very long. I probably played it for a couple of minutes. Then my brother came in and didn't want me playing it for one reason or another. But that's my first uh, Kirby memory. And, you know, from there, uh, I got older. I learned about them. I wanted to play more. I got really big into games during the GBA GameCube era. So there's a lot of Air Ride, a lot of Nightmare in Dreamland. Um, not so much Amazing Mirror, that was a game that my sister had, not really me for a while, but a whole lot of Nightmare in Dreamland, which is pretty funny looking back, because that's far from my favorite one. Uh, but Kirby's pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, Fire Emblem is a little different. That one isn't quite so simple. Um, around, it was around middle school, so around when, uh, the peak of my Kirby interest was high, I had met somebody, and he was a big fan of turn-based strategy games, um... And especially the one he was really into at the time was Fire Emblem, specifically Sacred Stones. Um, and I had tried Sacred Stones, and I didn't really get into it. I actually didn't like it that much. Um, but I said, maybe it's just this game. Let me play another one. He let me Radiant Dawn, which is a terrible game for newcomers. Um, so I was playing Radiant Dawn, and I, I hated it. Uh, I was just, I want nothing to do with this anymore. This stinks. I don't like it. It stinks. Stinks, stinks, stinks. <laughs> So that was that for a while. Years down the line, he was playing Advance Wars, and I thought it looked super interesting. And he said, no, no, you hated Fire Emblem. I remember how much you hated Fire Emblem. You are not going to like Advance Wars. But I said, no, I want to try it. I want to try it. I want to try it. So I tried it, and I loved it. I still love Advance Wars. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the remake that's coming out once things settle down. But I played Advance Wars 2, that was specifically the game, and I just, again, I loved it. So at that point, he said, I don't remember if it was me or him, but one of us said, well, if you love Advance Wars, maybe you could give Fire Emblem another shot. And the other, you know, there was no discussion, we just agreed. <laughs> you know, we wanted to do that. So I was lent Fire Emblem 7. Yeah, it was Fire Emblem 7, the seventh game, the first one that was released overseas. And sure enough, I loved it. I wound up playing uh, Sacred Stones right after. 
Then I played Radiant Dawn again. Then I finally got my hands on Path of Radiance, which wound up being my favorite game in the series to this day. I started replaying the others, starting getting into it on my own. It's been a bit of a rocky hill. I definitely think Fire Emblem, unlike Kirby, has its ups and downs, but I've been a fan for a long time, and uh, that doesn't like to be changing anytime soon. Uh, through the ups and downs, the very good ups and the very rough downs. <laughs> nice. So, something that I wanted to ask you is, for someone like me, because I'm a plebe, I'm I'm a dumb guy, uh, I, uh, the only thing I know about Fire Emblem, the way I got introduced to Fire Emblem, was through, like many people, Smash Brothers. And so, do you think, and this is gonna be kind of a weird question, but like, a lot of people um, see how Fire Emblem is represented in Super Smash Brothers, and they are kind of put off by the series, by the amount of characters, and how samey all the characters look, where I, when like, a lot of my friends have told me that that is not the case, and it's just Smash Brothers misrepresenting the characters. So how do you feel about the representation of Fire Emblem in Super Smash Brothers, and how it could put off players from trying the series? Well, I do think Smash, I actually am of the opinion that we have too many Fire Emblem characters in Smash Brothers. There is really two or three characters, depending on how you want to look at it, that really just don't have any right to still be in the, in, in Smash. I I would personally limit it to four. I would, Marth is the main character of the first game, so you would have him. Ike is extra, extra, astronomically popular, so you'd keep Ike. Awakening is really the game that saved the franchise, as it were, and Robin, of the Fire Emblem characters from Awakening, is the most unique, so I would keep Robin. And then, I mean, really, I would just say Krom, because he feels like kind of a celebration of the Fire Emblem characters that we have, so I would keep Krom. But if you want to get rid of Krom and just limit it to three, I, I think that's fine, too. You know, Kirby has three characters. I don't see Kirby and Fire Emblem having too big of a gap. But the, the unfortunate reputation that Fire Emblem has... It's just that, you know, it does have too many characters, and that's very true, but I also never really understood why having so many characters in a game that really has nothing to do with the franchise would make you not want to play the franchise. That is admittedly something that I've never understood. Even though I do agree, I wouldn't really hold that against Fire Emblem. I would just hold that against Smash Brothers. But I don't really think... If you look at Smash, see the Fire Emblem characters, and you say the series is bad, I, I would at least implore you to give, you know, give it a shot. The games are... Especially the ones that have been released overseas, they're very approachable. Uh, with maybe like one exception, maybe. None of them are really particularly super difficult on your average difficulty. So, I, I, it was more of a give things a shot. Even Fire Emblem fans think there's too many Fire Emblem characters in Smash Bros. Uh, we're in agreement. So, uh, don't, don't hate the game, hate the overabundance, I guess. Yeah, uh, I would personally replace, I'm not like a very big uh, Fire Emblem guy as I've said, but like when it comes to characters, yes I do agree on Marth, because I mean Marth, Marth the boy, uh, then Ike as you said, because yeah, it, he's very cool, because I think that the biggest, like he's so popular because of the Brawl subspace cutscene, I don't know if you remember the cutscene where uh, Meta Knight and Marth are fighting, and so you can see both of them like uh, trying to fight the subspace army from like all the darkness and stuff, and like they end up then getting saved by Ike that does like the upbeat, and it was very cool, and it was like wow, anime boy. So I think that that was how like he got super popular. Then yes, I do agree on Robin because of the diverse moveset, but I would replace. Um, Krom with someone who, in my opinion, had a little bit of a diverse moveset, uh, which I think was Byleth, which was, yeah, he wore, like, they were, well, well, one character, but, like, represented as both male and female, um, they had a more interesting moveset, in my opinion, because, yes, Krom represents more better the series, but... Uh, Byleth has more of a, represents the modern era in, but I could be wrong, what do you think of this? And also because... Uh, female Byleth is cute. That's right. I'm biased. Well, I I, 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 especially as of recent, I have heard a few people say Byleth would be a good addition just because it's the one character that fights. Oh, I mean, they all fight with swords, but Byleth also fights with a bow and lances and axes, so it covers the basic kinds of weapons. So I understand it from that point of view. I'm just people don't like Byleth. It's the unfortunate fact of the matter. Fire Emblem fans. Yeah. We are not really crazy about Byleth. Smash fans never gonna like Byleth after Fighters Pass One ended with with Byleth. 
Um, so the only, from a functionality perspective, I agree that Byleth is just straight up the best. But unfortunately, uh, most people that play games, gameplay isn't really the number one thing that they really look out for. Yeah. It's it's character. It's uh, a, a design. How, how fun uh, they are to play. How a little bit, but it's mostly you know what the opinion of that character is, especially for something like Smash Bros. You know. Um, you look at uh, what people think of Pikachu on the casual end. It's like, oh, it's Pikachu, most popular Pokemon. That means I either love him or I hate him. But you get people that play Smash Bros. a lot, you know, actually on a deeper level, and they're like, oh my god, Pikachu's so good in every game. He's he's ridiculous. He's strong. We hate this little rat. <laughs> um, so and I think in that regard, that would also help Krom out, because uh, people have been growing fonder of Awakening. Because Awakening went from people loved it to it was kind of like this Discord Discourse between the classic fans and the new fans, which Three Houses kind of might not be coming. Um, but you not only have that, but everybody knows Krom memes. Everybody knows Krom is the guy that didn't get into Smash Bros. Krom is the loser dad. Krom is the nerd. Yeah. You know, everybody knows Krom through those memes. So I feel like that would also be a good point for Krom. Is that unlike Byleth, a lot of people actually like Krom. Yeah, fair enough. Because I, it was actually one of the most requested Fire Emblem characters, if I remember correctly. But now let's move on from Fire Emblem because we've talked about uh, Fire Emblem for a long time now, and let's get back into Kirby because you know the name Kirby fan. I wanted to ask you something that is more of a personal question than anything. This was like a last-minute addition to the question sheet because when I try to make these scripts, I try to include the most popular questions, like how did this kind creator get to do this or that. But since you've mentioned Kirby's adventure a lot of times, what do you think of butter building? Okay, all right. Um, if we're talking about Kirby's Adventure, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I've got no complaints. If we're talking about Nightmare in Dreamland, though, uh, you may have heard me complain about this one before. People who know me, they know where I'm going to go with this. For some reason, in Nightmare in Dreamland, there is a part where there is fog. The room is very foggy. The fog slowly goes away, and there is a door. It's a little boring, but on its own, it's nothing bad. <laughs> But in Kirby's Adventure, there was this incredible technology that was so much fun to play. Where you would move to the right, and the buildings in the background would scroll. And it would look yep. like you were actually running through the buildings, and enemies would come in through the side. So it felt like you were actually moving forward. Kirby was going so fast that these buildings in the background, they couldn't even keep up. Enemies couldn't keep up with you. It was so cool. And then for the remake on Superior Hardware, where they replaced it with slowly disappearing fog, and I hate that so much. It, blood, it boils my blood. It's like, ah! <laughs> it's so frustrating. But if we're talking about Kirby's Adventure, uh, I genuinely love butter building. One of the most fun uses of an ability when you go through a butter building with like high jump. Some of the most fun. Because yeah. the whole level is about moving upward. So you just use high jump and you just zoom upward. It's so much fun. Even those uh, scrolling building bits I was mentioning before. You can high jump over the enemies or high jump to like the top. And you can just run on the top of the screen while all the enemies come from underneath. It's, it's really cool. I remember a lot of specific set pieces from Butter Building. Probably... Uh, it's probably the most memorable level in the game. I would maybe argue that Orange Ocean and Rainbow Resort, maybe. Uh, Rain Orange Ocean is more personal, but Rainbow Resort is just, you know, it's the end of the game. It's where the Kirby's Dream Land uh, final level is, where it's just the levels from there. You fight day to day, you get to the Fountain of Dreams, you fight the Nightmares. So maybe those. But if we're talking strictly through gameplay and we're removing my own bias of Orange Ocean, uh, Butter Building just has a lot of memorable bits to it. I really love Butter Building. Okay, so editing savvy, could you please put an applause? Because we got the first ever based guest of the show that loves butter building. Can we get an applause? Okay, jokes aside, it's been an inside joke in my channel since the the very start. Like, uh, that I love butter building for, like, the same exact reasons you've said. So much so that one time I was playing through, uh, like, all the different Kirby games and I've decided to do... Uh, for some weird reason, a ranking of all the different butter buildings. I, I am not joking of every different remix, playable version, and things, and I kind of trashed on uh, butter building of 
with like a nightmare in dreamland okay let me check where he put it it was very high because like the other ones were just remixes whereas this one was actually a playable one but i mean i trash so bad on this one because number one as you said the fog number two it's blue what type of butter is blue none probably i don't know radioactive butter but not butter building from the butter from the butter building and uh so yeah we have this inside joke in my channel and i ended up uh putting the the number one spot to the uh, Kirby 3D Classics on 3DS for only a reason. The part where the uh, the building spins around, if you any one of you has played uh, Kirby's Adventure, and I think that even Kirby fan can confirm, uh, that section had a little bit of lag sometimes, if I remember correctly. Uh, Kirby's Adventure had a lot of lag to it. Uh, depending on what ability you used, you could lag the moving buildings, yes. So, the best version, the, the, the thing is, this was the best version in my opinion, because the game was, they fixed the all of the slowdowns that the original game had. So, uh, the, the butter building is just so smooth and relaxing. And getting to this version, would you agree that this is the best version currently to play uh, Kirby's Adventure on a modern platform? Quote unquote, modern? Yeah, well, if we're going to count modern platform as Switch, 3DS, Wii U, uh, yeah. I would definitely say that. Wii U, uh, at least in my circles, it's pretty infamous. I don't know on a more casual level, but the coloration of Wii U yeah. emulation, that's Very that's what dark. they're doing. They're just em they're emulating the games. They're not actually anything cool. Um, but the coloration on the Wii U for everything that isn't like DS or GBA is horrible. Um, it, it was very, like, dark, if I remember correctly, for some weird yeah. reason. Like, in, yeah, very the, dark. in the Switch, they did the exact opposite problem, which they made everything too colorful. And, like, the perfect one, if I remember correctly, levels of emulation was, like, the Wii, because it was kind of dark, but it wasn't too colorful. It was, like, how it would show on an NES. Wii emulation, like, on the Wii, is actually some of the best, to this day, still one of the best kinds of emulation that we've ever had i don't know what happened with the wii u but i know for a lot of nes snes and n64 games maybe even genesis i don't know about that far but what a lot of people do at this point is just run the emulator through dolphin <laughs> because obviously it's wii it can run all these it's a virtual console game just do it like that a lot of people do that because just it's that good of an emulator um, and like you said, that's the problem with the Switch version. It's also technically a lot more money than any of the alternatives. Um, I would still say probably the most definitive, if you can, if you can even, if you can get your hands on a Wii U. I mean, unfortunately, get it anymore, uh, you know, legally, quote unquote. <laughs> but if you can get a Wii U that happens to have a Kirby's Adventure on the Wii, not the Wii U, but a Wii U with, on the Wii menu, that's Kirby's Adventure. You will have to deal with the slowdown, but just in terms of uh, options of controller, uh, visual presentation, the fact that you can play it on a nice big monitor without, you know, doing a, having an emulator or whatever, uh, I would still probably say the Wii version of Kirby's Adventure would be my favorite. Maybe Kirby's Dream Collection, only because it has that nice little border and there's no other differences. But, um... I mean, at that point, you know, it's it's pretty minuscule. Although, if you can get your hands on Kirby's Dream Collection, I'd recommend that anyway. Great way to play six great Kirby games. Um, but I would say I mean, 3D Classics is definitely purely based on the ground that it gets rid of the lag. <laughs> that has to be a good version, right? But uh, Wii is my overall favorite. But of the modern ones, I definitely agree. 3D Classics, uh, handily, the best way to play. Okay, that was a very good end uh, question. I agree with practically everything you said, uh, because the Virtual Console on the Wii was amazing, and I kind of regret the fact that Nintendo is not doing uh, Virtual Console like they used to back in the day. I'm going to sound like a boomer, but like back in the day, we used to have the Wii and the 3DS, and in my opinion, those games were much more better than paying for Nintendo Switch Online, because that's just basically renting the games. But Let's just get over that argument because we don't want to get into toxic Nintendo bullshit, <laughs> if you excuse these terms. Let's get into some other arguments and conversations about other stuff that you do in your channel. Uh, something that is very common on your channel and that 
probably all of your viewers know is that you also speedrun, which is something that I wanted to ask you. How did you get into speedrunning? Because it's something very particular, because you have to know a game from inside and out. Because uh, you have also done plenty of videos about the like Kirby in the Forgotten Land glitches and things. And so, how did you get into such a complex yet beautiful hobby? So I'm actually very glad that you worded it like that, because the very common misconception about speedrunning is that you do need to know a game inside and out and everything about it. But in reality, uh, if you just pick up a controller and kind of try to play the game quickly in a way that you like to do it, that's really good enough. I actually have somebody on my Discord server who speed ran for the first time after watching my stuff. They speed ran Kirby Star Allies. And the world record for that game is close to an hour 30. And on their first run, they managed a 230, 245, something like that. They didn't really know any of the strats. They just wanted to try it out. And they were talking about how much fun of a time that they had and that they really wanted to lower their time and how they weren't even last place on the speedrun.com leaderboards. They were, um, I mean, like lower two thirds, but like they were not even close to being in the last place spot. And that, that made them feel really good. So uh, the art of speedrunning isn't necessarily, if you want to go for a world record, that's one thing. But if you just want to do it to play a game that you really love in a way that you never have before, that's the true beauty of the art, so to speak, is not so much going for a world record, but going for a personal best, beating your own time. That's why I really like uh, highlighting different Kirby copy abilities for the spotlights, as they're called, because, yeah, you can look at Kirby's Adventure, the game we keep talking about. Tornado is pretty handily the best ability in that game. You use it for almost the whole thing. But to talk about Nightmare, it's a remake. There are people that run ability solos. They'll only use Beam or tornado or parasol or whatever uh kirby superstar is something very similar you've got uh beam categories like soft lock uh what's the fastest way that you can crash kirby superstar it's like 30 seconds that game's broken <laughs> um but there's so many different kinds of categories and that leads into how i got into it i was just playing um you know kirby and fire emblem and all that stuff i had my favorite abilities and i heard people like my favorite kirby copy ability this i don't keep a secret at all <laughs> The rest is a little up in the air, but uh, everybody knows my favorite Kirby copy ability is Parasol. And that is an ability that a lot of people like to dunk on a little bit. They like to say, oh, Parasol's, that's a loser ability. Nobody likes Parasol. And I remember saying, no, it's so good. It's so, uh, you, it's such a good ability. No one, no one can tell the otherwise. It's great. And then I saw people playing Kirby at the highest possible level, you know, like the best that you're going to play it. And sometimes I saw Parasol, sometimes I didn't. So I was wondering, why aren't these people using Parasol? And if they were, then I was wondering, yeah, they're using Parasol. What can I do to uh, be like that? So I just started looking into it myself, and that's just what kind of led down a rabbit hole. Very similar story with Fire Emblem. You know, say I really like Boyd from Path of Radiance, which I really do. Uh, what do people think about Boyd? Do people think he's really good? Do they think he's really bad? Why do they? Is he used in a speedrun? Is he used in a low turn count? There's all these different things that... It, it just it interested me, and then when I actually got to trying it, I was just, hey, you know, these Kirby games that I've been playing for 10, 15 years, you know, I'm starting to see them a little differently now. It's kind of cool. First of all, thank you, because I was just about to link to one of the other questions, and you basically just chained to this other argument in a very fluid way that is an argument that involves... And not really an argument, more of like a conversation that involves one of the biggest, if not the biggest series on your channel, that is Copyability Spotlights, which some of your oldest videos have been Copyability Spotlights. It's crazy how you're still doing them. So as you said when you were talking about speedruns, um, did you start making the series because you were interested in proving people, quote unquote, proving people wrong about certain stereotypes about copy abilities, or just because you wanted to show off how, uh, like, the pros and cons of certain copy abilities? It's, just, it's so interesting to me how Kirby copy abilities work, because unlike a lot of other games, there is very little in the way of limiting what you can do with Kirby, and unlike a lot of other platformers, your Marios, your Mega Mans, your Sonics, where those give you power-ups, you do have some kind of limitation to what you can do with them, and I always felt like the limitation for Kirby copy abilities was whatever your imagination could come up with. 
and I know I'm not the only person that thinks this, many people agree with the sentiment that Kirby copy abilities are very expressive. And that the Kirby games, especially once you really get into them, are some of the most expressive single-player games out there because of all the different things that you can do. And as I was saying before with that whole parasol shtick, I was curious uh, initially at how other abilities would do. And when I released the beam video, that very first one that I choose not to think about, um, I actually did have a speedrunner uh, get in touch with me and say, hey, listen, I love the idea, but you need better sources. <laughs> and they linked me better sources, and from there... Uh, that's when I really started getting into it. It was, uh, at first it was, I think I know what I'm talking about. I'm going to present it in a way that I sound like I know what I'm talking about, which that part worked. Uh, it worked well enough for a speedrunner to come to me and say, hey, uh, you know, again, love the idea. The presentation is great. It's just, you need better sources, which they gave me. And then from there, uh, that's when I released, I believe Spear was number two. And then High Jump after that. And by the time we got to High Jump, the speedrunner had even said, hey, this is much better. You know, good, good work. Good work. Yeah, yeah, you, you did the thing. Um, but once it got to a point where, you know, it was actually getting the attention of speedrunners, that's where I did kind of want to start taking it a little bit more seriously. The initial idea was just to kind of have fun, make it be like any other video that I would do. But once I kind of realized that, hey, you know, if speedrunners are going to get into this and this is an idea that's going to get a casual audience, maybe I could you know, kind of start taking it a little more seriously. And then the longer the videos went on, I kind of realized, hey, this is all just evolving into me saying, Tornado is good in adventure, Wing is good in Return to Dreamland, blah, blah, blah. So I tried to expand my research a little bit instead of saying, all right, well, obviously, uh, it's this ability dominates this game, but what can they all do? And that definitely, a lot of people really appreciated that because you don't want to go to a video about your favorite ability and just hear somebody say, oh, it could be good, but it's not. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. Um, and then recently, recently, I've expanded categories a little bit. It's not just, uh, beat the game quickly. Uh, there are other categories, like, uh, I've always done the boss rushes, but there's clear the entire game, do a full 100% kind of thing. Um, even some categories that I don't really count, but are just too fun for me to not want to bring up. Um, so I guess just to bring it all back to where it started, the reason why I want to do the spotlights... Of course, is to get the word out there, but also just to show people that um, Kirby speedrunning is very unique. And there are a lot of different ways that you can do it compared to any other kind of game. And if you are watching the videos and you're saying no, like, you're wrong. Uh, Mirror is actually much better than you're making it out to be. Then, by all means, please prove me wrong. <laughs> there are plenty of abilities that I really like that aren't any good. <laughs> So if, you know, you want to go out there, prove me wrong, that's why we have, you know, somebody saying, oh, Wing looks really good, or, oh, for the boss rushes, Hammer looks really good. They went out and they did the thing, and now we know they're really good. So if you just want to go out there, if you're not going to use Hammer to set world records, well, maybe you can go through an arena with only Beam and get the best time that anyone's ever gotten with Beam. You know, there is plenty of different ways to play these games. They're out there. They're waiting for you. Go for it. That's actually very inspiring, so thank you for the kind message to everybody who is watching. Something else that I want to talk about is, continuing to the, the um, discussion about arenas, there is also another way to complete the arena, and that is to complete it without any copy abilities. What do you think of those type of runs? Do you think that they are like, um, maybe they are not as fun as a copy ability run, but w like, what do you think of them? Oh, I love them. <laughs> I love normal Kirby runs. They're super interesting. Uh, <laughs> there is definitely a meta for a normal Kirby. You see a lot of people, even in the speedrun sense, you see a lot of people saying, just strip Kirby of everything. You know, you just have Kirby. How much can get done with the game? Even as recently as Kirby and the Forgotten Land, there is a category on speedrun.com for a normal Kirby only, which... Is very interesting that there's a whole meta in the game that just ignores copy abilities. I love that stuff. I, even though I am more of a speedrunner, I also really like, um, oh, I forgot. I think Meteors, I'm pretty sure. The no blocking, no abilities, like, no, it's just, you can't block, you can't heal. That was the other one. No healing, no blocking, no abilities. Uh, whatever the hardest difficulty of a true arena or Coliseum or boss endurance, whatever. 
Uh, they're very interesting. I really like watching those because obviously they're really hard. You know, you're just normal Kirby. You can't attack whenever you want. You gotta, you gotta wait. So I love watching those. They're super fascinating to me in a speedrun sense or just a challenge run sense. They're both super duper cool. So let's get this question out of the way because it's a question that I'm very, very, very interested. Which is, what is your favorite boss from the Kirby series? That is a good question. Um, at some point, I did rank the bosses, but um, it was a very old list. It was before I even did YouTube, so you're not going to find it on my channel. Um, I actually had going on a Kirby boss ranking series so I could really get to the answer of that question. But unfortunately, it just wound up taking too much time and I never really uh, finished it. I only got up to Kirby's Adventure. I finished Adventure. Um... But if I had to pick three, just off the top of my head, I don't know which one would be my favorite, but I think of these three bosses more than I think of any others. Uh, they would either be Kirby's Adventure Meta Knight, specifically Adventure, not Nightmare or Dreamland, none of the others, nice. specifically Adventure. Um, Superstar Ultra, the Masked Day-to-Day -day fight, or Return to Dreamland, spoilers, uh, the final boss, uh, probably the EX version, uh, Magalor. No um, way, Magalor's a traitor. I guess. Oh my, spoilers for oh my a 10 year old wow. game? Wow, like you totally couldn't tell that the second that he appeared on screen. Like, and we should get this out of the way right now. Also, spoilers for Superstar, Marks is a traitor too. If you yeah. couldn't tell. <laughs> yeah, know, that's another one. <laughs> also, yeah, Kirby players have trust issues. I personally agree with you about the, <laughs> the boss fight stuff because, um, first of all, NES Metal Knight is so cool. The scene of him standing on, like, the, this pillar in watching you. And, like, the thing is, uh, Kirby's Adventure is such an expressive game because you have seen him help you, giving the invincibility candies, doing this, doing that. He is just wanting to train you. So, in a way, you know that he isn't a bad guy. And that's just the proof. Because you see him, he isn't attacking you. He is offering you a weapon and you are approaching him. Yes, Obligatory JoJo reference moment. I'm sorry, I have to do this one per episode, and that's the thing. Another like favorite new boss of mine is the um, DDD boss fight from uh, spoilers Kirby in the Forgotten Land. It was so good, and the theme was so good. What what do you think of that's, the theme? Now? That's the best theme. That's the best theme. The Forgotten yeah. Land one for sure. Like it, the the goofy thing is imagining the like the studio of voice acting and like I think that everybody here knows that Kumazaki voices Didi and so I'm just imagining the scene of Kumazaki making like Didi noises when he's on all fours on a studio and like someone opening a door and seeing him like go hoo, hoo, hoo. That, that's just a funny <laughs> funny scene to me like I don't know why also Shoutouts to the madman, Kumazaki, for making DD voices. D don't you think it's wild how he has the guts and sheer will to do that? Yeah, yeah. It was Sakurai and Kirby 64, so it was like a passing of the baton in a way. Yeah. So to a weird question, quote unquote. Um, very, 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 very recently, if I remember correctly, only like two weeks ago or so at the time of recording this video, you have done a video on a game that is called Higurashi, if I remember correctly, which is a visual. Higurashi, right? yes, yes. I uh -huh, want yeah. to ask you, uh, first of all, how did you discover such a game? And second, do you uh, think that you could make more of this, like, quote-unquote, obscure titles? Like, you, you could make it into a series, because I myself have my stupid little series that is called is fighting. Yes, guys, for those watching right now, the series is not dead. I'm working on some new some new episodes, and I just talk about obscure fighting games that no one cares about. For example, like Asuka 100%, 120%, which is a Bishoujo fighting game. Do you know what a Bishoujo fighting game even is? Uh, I do, yeah, like Sailor Moon S. She knows, she knows, my bad. I, I thought she wouldn't know, but like... <laughs> no, all, good, to, all good, all good, all <laughs> good. Uh, so, like, uh, getting back to the question, how did you discover the, the title? And also, like, can you think of, like, doing more of that? Like, more of more titles, like, more videos on obscure titles? 
So specifically in terms of how I found Hashi, um, you're going to listen. If you want the more expanded story, I do a podcast with my friends, Random Bystander here in the Wash. Uh, at the time of this recording, the most recent series that we've completed was Higurashi. We went through the eight uh, original novels, uh, some extra stuff, and then ranked the characters at the end, which was, a uh, oh boy, that was fine. So if you want a more um, elongated version of my thoughts, if you're listening to me and like, wow, I wish I could listen to her talk about Higurashi for like 20 hours. There you go. Um, Link it in the description. But in terms of the, the long story short, as we will, Higurashi in 2006, around the time it wrapped up, got an anime adaptation. And just because it was so much shorter, much easier to subtitle, that's how a lot of people found out about it. Myself included. I had gone through the 2006 anime series and I thought, wow, that was really, really good. And somebody had told me, wait, why did you go through the anime when you can go through the sound novel instead? And I was thinking, all right, well, there's no way it can be as good as the anime. Like, no way. And then I went through the first one and I, I just knew, like, my life was going to be <laughs> forever changed from that point forward. I blew through the novels and I just, I loved it. It really did change me in a lot of ways. Again, if you want to know more, you know, I don't want to get too uh, philosophical on here. You know, you can uh, listen to the podcast for that. But uh, I knew that I wanted more people to read the sound novel, especially the person who told me to read the sound novel because they had never read the sound novel, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> um, but that's how I found out about it. Um, as far as making content similar to that video in the future, I'd really like to... But the unfortunate thing is that you kind of have to play the numbers as, as it is. And yeah. when I get really big, when my videos can actually uh, be sustainable, I don't mind making a video like that every once in a while. Unfortunately, the Higurashi video only has, I think, 420 views. <laughs> Funny number. It's something like that. Uh, it's very low in terms of view count. And yeah, I do kind of need to... 453. Just check. Oh, all right. All right, a little better than what I thought. <laughs> um, but I do need to think about the numbers, especially when, uh, you know, it's like I put out a video talking about my LGBT story that has 3,000. I put out the Cutter Spotlight that has 2,000. So seeing 453 is a little... Eh. I did love making that video, and I did love talking about Higurashi. Um, at the time of recording, it's not out yet, but by the time this episode comes out, it 100% will be. Uh, one of my... If it's not today, it's coming out tomorrow... Um, because Klonoa came out today, the remakes of Klonoa, and I'm making a video about, uh, how Klonoa is a lot like Kirby in a lot of ways. Wahoo. So that's kind of, you know, in the vein of, you know, it's about something I don't really talk about very much, but it is going to incorporate Kirby, and I'm hoping that really helps out. If it does, then that's probably what I'll do going forward. I'll talk about things that I really like that either people don't know or you don't get to talk about a lot, and compare it to something like, uh, Advance Wars and Fire Emblem. That's the easiest one. <laughs> Yeah, I think you would do like, like something to um, a lot of different content creators that like, do this when talking about obscure games. Firstly, like you start off with popular series and obscure titles inside series. Like, and I know this is kind of a little bit of a bad thing to do, but it's the best thing to do. Uh, like uh, YouTube wise, you just title a video like the Kirby game you've never heard about or like the Sonic okay. game you've never heard about. Like in all caps and stuff. Even though it's clickbaity, people love titles like that. Like, I am a Kirby fan. How could I not know of Kirby's panel fun or whatever it was called? How was the, the title of the uh, the Kirby right by catch again? It was like the e-reader. Like, that stuff like that. And then after that, maybe you can just start exploring a little bit more and start risking and start talking about series. Like... But like putting something like the best visual novel you've never talked about. And like, or something like that. Maybe would be would be more cool, but I think I am of the same ideology of yours as spreading content that like nobody really knows or cares about is something very good because you get um, a bigger phantom, a bigger fan base. Now getting into the spicy argument, the very interesting things. We're gonna talk about VTubing, which is a subject that I am very, very, very interested about. So. You know the drill, we've asked this question for many different times, we've asked for YouTube, Fire Emblem, Kirby, speedruns, how did you get into VTubing? I know I am very good at making questions. <laughs> well, they're good questions, so that's all that matters. <laughs> um, so VTubing is... It's very simple, it's just... I don't, I don't want... I don't want... 
I'm going to tell this story. I don't really want anybody thinking that, like, this is being dragged out of me. I'm very open about this kind of thing. If you ask me this question, this is the answer that I'm going to give. I'm not just doing it because Savvy's making me or whatever. No, no, no. That's not it at all. This is willing. This is uh, consensual, as it were. Um, but I've been streaming on Twitch for a while. I've only been VTubing for, I want to say, nine months now. But I've been streaming for over two years, very closely to when I started the YouTube channel, actually. So eh, it's actually probably closer to three now that I think about it. <laughs> um, but I have been streaming for a while. And one thing that I had always kind of noticed, and everybody will tell you this, is that when you don't have a face to attach to, it's much harder to build a crowd. You need that face so that on a psychological, personal level, people can say, oh, this is how they're reacting. Uh, this is what they look like. I feel like I can know this person. I was just a Kirby icon at that time. My stream itself, it was like a purple and blue gradient with the game on screen. There was no icon, no person for people watching to say, oh, that's Kirby fan. That's who I can get attached to. I was just a voice. Mm, yeah, I but <laughs> on the flip side, uh, I am, like I said, we're not going to get too into this, but I'm trans. I don't want people knowing what I look like. I don't pass. So this was, it was tough. <laughs> and then around the time that I was starting to do content creation, maybe a little bit after, was when, uh, this is a name you probably know, even if you don't follow VTubers, but uh, a certain somebody, Inugami Korine, oh. that is when she was getting really big. Um, and I don't really watch uh, a lot of the big VTubers, but if I get the chance, I will Watch Corine. I think she's very funny. I think she's very sweet. I love dogs. Um, nice. I think I think Corine, even as somebody who's not really too into the mainstream kind of VTuber, uh, I think even for someone who's not into those, I love watching her stuff. Uh, <laughs> like uh, when she wants to eat your finger, she'll go Yubi Yubi. When she wants to excite the English audience, she'll go, hey guys. It's really, really funny. She's really funny. Um, but seeing a VTuber software kind of grow and evolve and become really big over time, I thought, yeah, no, this is like the perfect middle ground. I don't have to show my face, but I can still give the audience a face to attach to me. That's not just Kirby. Um, so I went to Picrew. I didn't even draw it myself because I can't draw it, but I went to a Picrew. I got my, I got a base design ready, got a reference sheet set up, and I got a PNG drawn because PNGs are very affordable. So I drew a really like nice looking PNG, um, and I set it up on I forget what the software is called, but it's a free PNG tuber software. Absolutely wonderful. I wish I remembered it so I could plug it for any aspiring VTubers. I'm sorry, um, but I used that for a while, and it was working. But I really wanted a full model because the one thing that the PNG was missing was expressions. I had one face, and that was really it. And the whole point of this was that, you know, people can get a face that emotes so they can get attached to it. And I had the face, but not the emotion. So I learned how uh, VTuber software worked. I commissioned a model. I commissioned somebody to rig it because I'm not doing that. Um, and then I finally really debuted as a VTuber. And uh, it was a good choice. It's definitely uh, paid off. And I definitely feel like people i mean obviously i hate to i hate to immersion break but i think everybody knows i don't have a dog tail i don't have dog ears sorry i'm sorry <laughs> but you know people can still you know look at this excited puppy girl right and they can be like oh yeah that's claire fluffle oh yeah that's kirby fan like that's finally what i really needed because for, for youtube like the spotlights did that okay but the name of the game with youtube and twitch and all these websites is how personable are you? Are you are you a personable person? I can be I can be as nice as I want. I can be as mean as I want. It's not gonna matter. You don't know something that I look like. You, you can't attach anything to me, like I've been saying. So, um, the long and short of why I wanted to get into VTubing is just because I wanted that, because that would get me more views, and more views means more money. Ah, uh, yeah. That's right, the money. Okay, I have cash three, money. <laughs> yeah, the three things to say about your answer number one i completely get uh trying to be more expressive because this is coming from someone who at the time of recording this video has one avatar and uh savvy my avatar is always smiling no matter the situation i i am in immeasurable pain right now but i, I i'm stuck smiling Can we put forever the smiling the guts team or something right now <laughs> okay jokes aside <laughs> like the thing is i get getting like wanting to be more expressive and as you said YouTube likes 
personalities more than people. So they want something that can be marketed. Like, I want this person a t-shirt. I'm sorry, desk. I'm gonna do a one of I did a one of desk abuse uh, back in the day and I still do, poor desk. But getting back, second thing, also, secondary thing, as we talked about with Kirby, will not uh, really touch on this argument, but I even completely get wanting to uh, not being comfortable with maybe anything or an entry. I don't know, because, like, I, for myself, I hate to break it with you, to you, but, like, as Kirby herself has said, uh, she does look like a puppy and I don't look like a pretty anime boy. I'm sorry, I wish I could, but I think that an avatar doesn't really have to be the person. An avatar has to be the personification of their personality. Like, wow. Um, jokes aside, like, my pose is meant to be the stylish, the goofy, and the outfit is meant to be the elegance, and uh, the Toonie character is meant to represent that this is not a serious channel, this is meant to joke around with. Now, also, yeah, Koroni is very wholesome. Koroni uh, was like my first ever exposure to VTubers, and then down the rabbit hole I went. I do not really follow VTubers live, but I follow especially Hololive, which, with everybody here maybe watching the video, um, Korone is from Hololive, Gorgura is from Hololive. Uh, so yeah, that's the main thing that I, the main company, quote-unquote, because it's kind of weird, but yeah, it's a company that I, um, I follow of VTubers. So you may be wondering with such a talented guest that we have today, what kind of dumb activity can we do? And to that I say, the best type of activity ever, tier lists. Uh -oh. Kirby Khan has had many tier lists on her channel, so check them out, it's in the description. And so today we have, and I'm going to share my screen, we have a Kirby character tier list. Not, that's right, not a Kirby copy ability team, a tier list, because that would be too predictable. So, can you see the screen? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, if you, uh, okay, wait. Uh, we have a lot of characters here. We have Highness, we have Adeline, Ribbon, but I think that we should start from the main boy himself. I think we should start from Kirby, right? Uh, yeah, that sounds good. I see Kirby and Yarn Kirby are on here. Um, oh god, yeah, true. Uh, also, but I also, Prince Fluff isn't on here, so if you just want to replace Yarn Kirby with Prince, like, you, you yeah. know, not editing the tier list or anything, but just as far as, like, what we're talking about. Uh, yeah, we can also, just, when we get to Yarn Kirby, we'll make that Prince Fluff. I'm fine with that. Yeah. Also, just a little thing, how are we ranking the characters? I thought about ranking the characters based on how lovable they are, on how, like, personal they are to us, and, uh, I don't know, how cool they are or something? Like, how would you rank them? How How likely they are to do their taxes. How <laughs> likely they- okay, okay. Starting off with Kirby, I would say D tier. It's a baby. Ah. <sighs> Um, see, I don't know. I'm thinking, like, I don't know about D tier, because, I mean, maybe, like, C, because I don't think Kirby would do his taxes, but D tier would be, like, I'm committing tax fraud, no, and I love tax it. Tax fraud, yeah. Let's call it yeah. tax. Tax fraud. <laughs> I like it, yeah. That's and then C tier is just, like, they don't do their taxes. Like, there's no, there's no uh, games being played here, you know, they're just not going to do their taxes. Uh, then B, uh, they do, but not always... Yeah, yeah, that's respectable. Yeah, I like uh, it. They do. Um, and then what they, they do, and them. they help others do their taxes too, maybe? Oh, yeah, they, they love them. They work at TurboTax. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they work at TurboTax. <laughs> at TurboTax. Okay. So, All right. and with that in mind, I definitely think Kirby uh, would fit in C or what is they now. Don't. They don't. Yep. They don't. They don't. So, uh, I'm going to club with that there. Kirby, uh, King DDD does not do taxes at all. I think he. No. Like. <laughs> yeah, no, he is, he's a, in his mind anyway. He's the equivalent of the government, right? So, in his mind, he doesn't even have to do them. Okay. Uh, the thing is that it's like. I. I don't know if he does uh, tax fraud or evasion, though. I don't think he would actively go out because he's not saying 
you know, I'm not doing my taxes. I'm going to do something worse. He's just saying, you know, I'm royal. I, I'm the government. You know, we don't need to do. So, so I would don't. just put him a uh, similar boat to Kirby. There's just but a different like mindset behind it. He would do less taxes than Kirby. So it's moving a little bit here. Like Kirby yeah. would do taxes more often than him. Now, moving on. Uh, Meta Knight. I think... I think... I think... I don't think Meta Knight's a TurboTax guy, but I think Meta Knight does his taxes. Yeah. Yep. On the other end, Magalore. Magalore scam. Tax fraud. Tax fraud. Tax, tax fraud. fraud. Tax fraud. That, like... We can, we, can we, we should make we should make a list below, uh, like a tier yeah, below uh, that one called Magalore Tax how, Fraud. How you can do that. Oh, 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 oh what did I do? Oh, wrong way. <laughs> Um, um, yeah, it should still be good. If you, I mean, you don't have to. I was just kidding. But if okay, you do that and then add rope, well. Above, no, no. The bandana D. Uh, does he do his taxes? Mm -hmm. I so here's the thing about bandana D. It's a little dicey because I don't know. He's definitely smart enough. Yeah. I don't know if he really sees the need to do his. Like, if he does, he works at TurboTax for sure. But. Really? It might, also, it might also be like. Maybe not always though. That's thing too. Like it could, he could, but maybe not always. It's either it's one of those two. I was a little conflicted as to which one it would be. So I think that they do, but not more than Mennonite. I think at all. But he is all about helping other people. He would totally work at TurboTax. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, I just, I just the question would be, does he do it all the time? But I guess if the question, if he does it enough to work at TurboTax. Then yeah, he would work at Turbo Tax. Uh, Prince Fluff, because yes, this is Prince Fluff. Um, nah, I don't think he knows what taxes are. <sighs> well, see, here's the here's the thing. He does have a residency, uh, at the uh the apartment. He's got Kirby's pad. He lives there with Kirby while they're in Patchland. So we do know that there is some kind of financial structure in Patchland. Yeah. But uh, I don't. He's not a TurboTax kind of guy. He's <sighs> maybe they do, but not always. Just maybe sometimes. Yeah, I'm kind of thinking yeah. that. I'm kind of thinking that. Uh, moving on to someone wild, the Roach, tax evasion. Tax evasion. Yep, he's a thief. He's a thief. Tax he's evasion. Thief. Uh, Morpho Nine. Uh, I don't know. He doesn't. Seem I don't know. Tax um, I mean, I would just say Morpho Nine because, like, I mean. You know what? Morpho Knight wouldn't go out of his idea. way to, like, care. Wouldn't Morpho Knight just kind of... I, I think I have an idea. New, new tier. Yeah, that, that, can work. that can work. That can work. Because, like, yeah, I, like I, I don't think he knows. He's an ancient warrior. So Yeah, he just kind of possesses, he just kind of possesses people. So. And I would, you put, would you put Kirby there, too, then? Yeah. And I think okay. that... <sighs> Star Dream also... Like it would seem like a tax evasion guy, but yeah, yeah I mean, I mean, it, Star Dream knows everything. Yeah, uh, it's part of being a computer. But but also part of being a computer would be committing tax evasion or tax fraud. So, uh, so like, what do you think that they just don't, or they just straight up? Uh, uh, so the thing fraud? is, is that the, the thing with Star Dream is that when we see Star Dream, Haltman is in control, and Haltman only wants money, so Haltman would commit tax fraud. So Haltman would have Start Dream commit the tax fraud so he can make more money. Therefore, I would say Start Dream commits tax fraud. Yeah. More than, than the Roach or less than the Roach? I would say less only because there is kind of the chance that, you know, somebody else gets Star Dream and they don't make it. The Roach yeah. will no matter what. Uh, but Shadow the Star Dream that we know, Kirby. absolutely would. Uh, Shadow Kirby, I think that they do. Because, like... It's a nice guy. It's just kind of a coward. I don't think they would be brave enough to do tax fraud or to not do taxes. Maybe around yeah. Prince Fluff or they straight up do. Uh, yeah, Shadow Kirby's a little bit uh, tricky. I mean, maybe maybe they do only because it is very clear from Amazing Mirror that Shadow Kirby is like, you know, I always do the right thing. You know, I'm, I'm good. So yeah. maybe they do. Maybe, maybe they do. Yeah, they do. But not as much as... I don't know, Man and I, because uh, Man and I seems like the tax men. Shadow Kirby, I don't know. I don't know about this one. Yeah, no, I, I agree. The Free Mage Sisters. I don't know. I think that Flamberge would do tax fraud. Uh, Francisca. I know Flamberge. 
I don't think Flambridge would have the patience for any of that. I would just say Flambridge wouldn't. And then Francisca and Zan are responsible that they do. So I'm saying that we put it under they do, but not always, because all yeah. it, if like but if the sure if the sisters same. get if the sisters get into an argument and Flambridge's taxes don't get done, that's all it takes. So I'm yeah. gonna say they do, but not always. Dark matter swordsman. Yes, I'm picking random characters. Who do you think <laughs> would be? Uh, also, I should record my screen. Uh, the thing is, uh... <sighs> Dark Manor Swordsman. Would he know? I what mean, maybe the people know? that he possesses would know, but I don't really think the Dark Manor Swordsman himself would know. So yeah, they don't. They don't, or they just straight up evade taxes? I would, I would just say they don't. I don't think they would like straight up evade it, but... Yeah. I, I think similarly to like how day to day would work. Um, uh, Marks doesn't. Straight up. Marks oh yeah, no, Marks. Marks, we can put like, like I don't know about the same. Yeah, I don't know about the same because the thing about Magalor is that he steals your money and then doesn't pay taxes for that. Yeah. Marks just. So I would not put Marks in the same tier as Magalor, but I would put Marks in the same tier as like Daroach and Star Dream for sure. Yeah, but like very. Like, yeah, not dead as last. Much. Dead last. Yeah. Because like, uh, dead last. Yeah. Uh, Galactonite. Uh, I think that since they are an ancient warrior, they're not like, they're kind of like Morphonite, so I don't think that they know what taxes are. I think Galactonite predates taxes. Yeah. So, like, what are taxes? Yeah. 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 What, what are taxes? like, tax? not as much as Morphonite. Morphonite would be more confused. It's a butterfly. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Funny Clockman. Funny Clockman. Nova. Ah. Uh, <sighs> Um, no, I don't know about this one, Chief. Grants wishes. Okay, so Nova grants wishes, right? Yeah. Somebody has to have gone to Nova and wished, hey, can you do my taxes for me? And then he says, yeah. okay, three, two, one, go. So I'm going to say Nova is under they do, but not always. Yeah. It's kind of lagging. That feels the most like true neutral to me, which is absolutely what uh, Nova is. Uh, choose a character next, because I don't want to be the one choosing every single character. Like, out of all these. Um, have Vanity's some... looking lonely up in the TurboTax tier. I think Adeline and Ribbon, I mean, I know they're just kids, but, like, they would help. I think they would, they would be TurboTax. Adeline would, but Ribbon, I think Ribbon would be kind of like, okay, Ribbon is smarter than Kirby. Proved. Like, it's, I, I, I know it for proof that Ribbon is smarter than Kirby. But I think that they just, um, Ribbon would, but not always, whereas Adeline would, and they work at TurboTax. Would you yeah, well, I mean, the, the way that I am look, choosing to look at it is that it's like a Star Allies kind of thing, where Adeline and Ribbon are, are besties, and they just kind of do everything together, which would oh, include, yeah. you know, doing TurboTax. So they, they, they're like colleagues, friendly colleagues. Yeah, yeah, they're besties. Rib okay, is ribbon bitch. is ribbon is a uh, ribbon is a hesitant works at TurboTax, <laughs> but all the same. Yeah. Okay. I, as I was saying, she's a bitch. She doesn't pay taxes. Nah, ju ju yeah. No, she's definitely. Uh, she no, nah, she's royalty. We can put her in tax pride. Yeah. She's royalty. Yeah. Uh, not as much as Marks though. Marks would definitely. Marks would run a pyramid scheme. And now we basically only have final bosses apart from these two. So I think that we should uh, get. Uh, these two away, and then think about every other thing here on the West. So Susie, she she doesn't at all. No, Susie Susie doesn't. So they, I don't they, think she's quite as I don't think she's quite as ambitious as her father. I don't think she would try to pull a tax fraud scheme, but she definitely goes out of her way to not do her taxes. Yeah, and Taranza, I think he's a good guy. He would, but like not always. Yeah, no, Taranza does. I don't think I don't quite think TurboTax because he's too depressed, but. <laughs> Uh, I definitely think he does his taxes. He lacks some bitches. Bam. Oh, poor guy. Poor, poor baby. Poor baby. Uh, this is interesting. I don't think any of these pay taxes. But let's inspect them one by one. Highness. Uh, I definitely I definitely think Landia does their taxes. Yeah, Landia does. Because Landia is actually uh, four good boys. Uh, I don't think Turbo... T I mean, that would be a super efficient Turbo Tax with four people. But I, I I don't think they would go that far. I just think they do their taxes, they chill at their volcano, and they have a good time. Okay. Uh, Dr Drossia. Drossia, does, does Drossia do taxes? 
Maybe. Maybe. I mean, Drossia, Drossia was actually pretty, from what I remember, Drossia was initially just, you know, a regular old painting, and then became evil when, when she came to life. So she So, does, I, I don't even know if she would know what taxes are. So what are taxes? Yeah, because I think the only things that she really knows are being a painting and being a witch. Yeah. Oh, the, the, the funny scouter man. <laughs> he, he doesn't. Yeah, no. I think he beats up anybody who tries to make him do his taxes, but that's still not quite fraud or evasion. He just doesn't do it. Dark man, no, he, he doesn't. Dark man, and I doesn't at all. No, no, no. He's like the evil no. affection, so I think he would straight up maybe tax fraud. <sighs> well, if, if he's the opposite of Meta Knight, and Meta Knight just does his taxes, he doesn't. He's not so into it that he works at TurboTax. I don't think Dark Man. I mean, Dark Man Knight is evil, but I don't like tax fraud and evasion is like I'm going, um, like, like I'm trying to make other to... people's lives miserable in a way yeah. that isn't just like killing them on the spot. Dark Man Knight is like killing them on the spot. Also, it's just <laughs> so. move a little bit, not nah, Landia, because I think Landia does more taxes than Shadow Kirby, and Taranza does more than Shadow Kirby, and I think that. Uh, the funny Sandsman does not at top of them all. Like, I think this would be the scheme. Because, like, Susie doesn't seem like she really wants to. What What do you think? Um, no, no, no Susie's fine where she is. Okay, so, uh, let's choose another character. Well, let's... Hell, let's just kind of get the ones that, like, wouldn't really know what taxes are out of the way. Like, the quote-unquote boring ones uh dark nebula and zero would not know what taxes are yeah. straight up Where is zero um uh no that's void zero oh, is the sorry, one with the dark matter sorry, dudes around him no. although i mean you could put void there too i don't think void would know what they I are either i wouldn't and i think that uh i think that the problem is that all of these would not do their taxes he would he he doesn't know he doesn't know my bad uh, but, like, all of these, Night Nightmare commits tax fraud, 100%. I can buy that. I can buy that. Yeah. Uh, I, I forgot his name. Uh, uh, fake Kirby fan. Uh, Mirror Dude. Oh, Dark Mind? Oh, yeah. Dark Mind? Dark, dark Mind. I'm sorry, my fake Kirby-ness fan is showing, you know? <laughs> and that's just because uh, I haven't really played that much of uh, Amazing Mirror. I think he wouldn't. But not really tax fraud. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go that far. Yin Yarn. What, was that his name? Yeah. It's Yin Yarn, yep. Yeah. Yin Yarn's pretty funny because uh, the big plot point of Epic Yarn is that he dismantles the royalty to become ruler of Dreamland. So you can definitely make tax jokes that way. Um, I don't think I would go as far as tax fraud, though. I think he's a little too goofy to try pulling that something like that off. But I also would say... If you had to ask me if he paid his taxes or not, with relative confidence, I'd say no. So they, they don't. Straight up don't. And Highness? Okay, I want to save Highness for last for a reason. Because there is like... It's kind of weird. but we All like... these different tiers with the lore that we have about Highness. You could put Highness in any of these tiers and it would line up. Um, In the current state that he's in, I don't think he knows what taxes are. But if he's trying to get people to join his cult, I think he would use that as a way to commit tax fraud or evasion. Um, he could just be so far gone that he knows taxes, but the Dark Lord is more important. Uh, maybe he did a couple times and that led into the Dark Lord. Maybe one of the few things left that he does is still that he does pay his taxes. And maybe when he gets, spoilers, when he gets uh, healed at the end of Star Allies, maybe because uh, he saved the lives of the Mage Sisters. Like, he went out of his way to do that. So maybe yeah. he wants to be that helpful at TurboTax. Like, you can put him in any of these tiers. Uh, so Except Magalore. You can't, you can't put him with Magalore. <laughs> maybe can't. let's make a new one. God, but no, no. I don't, I don't know about that because Magalore, Magalore should be the only one that has his own list. <laughs> uh, I think... I don't know. You tell me. No, nah, I think that Magalore should be the only one that has his own. Yeah. I think... Because the thing about Highness is that if we go by his current state of mind, I don't think he knows what taxes are. I think yeah. he's too he's too hyper focused on the Dark Lord. Um, so we can either put him there, or if he's you know in a proper state of mind, then I think uh, Turbo Tax is also okay. But I think as it is, 
Uh, when you get to his boss fight, he's too far gone. And that was a very, very, very cool episode because today's guest Kirby fan was a super cool person is a super cool person and also because we talked about many different things that we really didn't discuss on the um last episodes of the shabby the shabby show you know the, the savvy show we talked about kirby yeah but we didn't talk about fire emblem or speed running or vtubing so we got a lot of different information if you enjoy this content you know what to do click the link down below and it's not actually a link it's a button it's red it's uh, it's written subscribe on it maybe I'm worth of your subscription and that would be cool and I also ask you to check the link in the description where you can all you can all find every single piece of social media where Kirby fan is so you'll find um, Twitch you'll find YouTube you'll find her podcast you'll find everything and, and check check her out don't be don't be a dumb dumb and do the right thing so, uh, Kirby fan, how was this weird experience at the Savvy Show? Uh, this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me. I was not expecting to talk about Kirby characters and their relation with taxes today, but it was worth it. It was a lot of fun. You know, that's the beauty of the Savvy Show. Whenever a guest gets here, they don't know, and they're going to be a changed person once they once the episode finishes. So <laughs> that was all for today. And uh, Butter Building is the best location from any video game ever. And subscribe to uh, the both of us. Um, and thanks for checking out this out. If you're right through this point of the video, that means that you really care about this. And so thanks. And that's all for me. And I'll see you all on the next episode. Savvy out. Bye.